So, it seems that the Conservatives, after the National Conservative Conference, which we covered here very favourably, actually, and I was delighted to have attended, so thank you to the organisers for inviting me, seems that the actually Conservative, capital C Conservatives, decided to do some conserving, at which point this means rebuilding, because we're in a society of utter ash heaps, all of our values have been torn asunder, it's hard to have families, and we're taxed to death. And so they thought, well, that's not really a good thing, both electorally and morally, to allow our country to degrade in such a way. So we, after doing a bit of Pavlovian politics and praising the politicians when they do something right, we, we gave them a little bit of dinner when they rang that little bell, and so now it seems that the exact kind of conservatives we wanted to do something are doing something. So today let's look at the state of play and how we're being betrayed by the establishment versus this new vanguard which has risen from the midst. And I know it's a bit bleak out there, guys, but, you know, we're trying to make some change best we can. So if we go on to this one, just a just a plug, first of all, if you're all not aware that we've been demonetized by YouTube, as little as five pounds a month can help us keep the lights on. The Conservatives are sick of liberalism, and so is Carl. So he decided to debate liberalism with our fantastic Stelios here for his symposium series. I know there is a part two of this coming out. Do you want to give a brief overview of what this conversation entailed? Well, the second part is going to be about a different conversation. It's going to be about a comprehensive uh, lib about comprehensive liberalism. Mm -hmm. It's not exactly part two, but there may be a part two about, uh, about uh, of this in the near future. Yeah, and, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah. and I watched this, so I really enjoyed it. But Carl's complaint is very much like the similar complaint that a lot of the academics and even MPs like Miriam Cates, my favourite, gave in this conference, which was that liberalism has metastasized, it's spread like a cancer, going from protecting the individual from unjust incursions by the state on their liberty to destroying relationships in the Rousseauian conception so that they allow the individual to maximally consume things without ever relying on other people. And that's quite alienating. So just one thing to say on that, my, let's say, position in the debate is that just because some positions of liberalism don't work and have really negative consequences, we shouldn't throw the baby out of the bathwater. Yeah, and I think that's a valuable conversation yeah. to have within the discourse of the right. That's what happened at the conference, and if you want to be better informed, you can go and watch that video. So let's jump onto the first one. Let's look at what exactly the establishment are doing to stonewall this conservative revivalism within the conservative party. So it comes straight from the top. Rishi Sunak, professional useless person who nobody elected and nobody wanted because he's a globalist stooge, has been consulted on what he's going to do to stop the invasion at the south coast in over the English Channel by all of the boat migrants, the seafaring insurgents who pack up our hotels and make it so that working people of Britain have most of their income parceled off so that the, a bunch of 20, 30-something Afghans and Africans can sit around, smoke, and buy trainers from JD Sports. I love my country sometimes. So Rishi Sunak has said, I won't rest until we can stop the boats. And he only means the little dinghies. He doesn't mean the big ones that are bringing over millions of people every year legally. He wants the safe legal routes to be the real thing and to crack down on small boats. It's one of his five pledges. Frankly, I, I fundamentally just don't believe him, but, but we'll listen to what he says. So Rishi Sunak has vowed not to rest until we can stop the boats, and he said that Britain can lead the way in tackling illegal migration in Europe. The Prime Minister used a rare summit of the Council of Europe in Iceland to call on the European Court of Human Rights, the ECHR, to reform its approach to interim injunctions, which we used to block the first scheduled deportation flight to Rwanda in the 11th hour in June last year. Yeah, there's still not been many people deported to Rwanda at all. They've built massive hotels out there. We're giving them loads of money. And also the Rwanda deal isn't a solution because it turns out it's an exchange program because for the people that we send over, they send over Rwandans to come and use the NHS. Okay. So we're going to yeah. be footing the bill for other foreign nationals. So it's not going to solve the problem. It's just going to be a pipeline. As you will see, the, the UK has, to a large extent, the same problem with Greece with regards to immigration. Right. And this has to do with uh, borders of the sea, the sea borders. And it's very difficult to guard against them, but it's doable. Yeah. Or you can just turn them around and say no. And the fewer economic incentives that they would get upon arriving, the fewer people are incentivized to make the journey in the first place because they show up and they know they're going to get nothing and they're possibly going to disappear into the system and get no handouts, then nobody's going to want to come. They'll just sit and stay in Calais until Care for Calais give them a handout instead. Sorry, I must revise it. I wanted to say to guard them, not guard against them. I don't want to... Yeah. 
The UK is attempting to reform the European Court's use of the interim injunctions, known as Rule 39 orders, so they can't be used to arbitrarily block future deportations without representation from member states or transparency over the decision. Sunak said he was also using his visit to Reykjavik and meetings with individual European leaders to urge closer cooperation on tackling illegal migration, acknowledging his domestic efforts to stop the boats with his migration bill must go hand in hand with closer international partnerships, basically saying that these countries that they're passing through either detain them or send them back there so they don't have to come to Britain as the final resting stop. We are currently the world's halfway house, the dumping ground for economic chances, and it's destroying the country. So hopefully someone gets a handle on it. But I don't think Rishi Sunak will, because he's been told in this article, Iceland's foreign minister rebuffed Sunak, saying the Council of Europe summit was not being used to reform the European court's rules. So he came there, he said he was going to do it, but that's not the purpose of the meeting, so it didn't get done. Now, you cannot laugh at the next article, right? Stelios, look me in the eye. Tell me. You can't laugh, okay? This is the person who has helped block the ECHR reform, this very masculine man. (coughs) Tiny Cox, the Dutch senator who is president of the Council of Europe's Parliamentary Assembly, you couldn't make it up, told The Guardian that Britain will end up like Russia and face exclusion if it chose to ignore obligations to abide by the Strasbourg-based court. Tiny Cox told us that we can't control our own country. That really does summarise British politics for the last 30 years, doesn't it? Anyway, moving on to the next one. The reason we've got to get a handle on this is because, as Matt Goodwin has shown in this graph here, the government spends $1.3 billion a year on housing boat migrants. $1.3 billion. And that's higher than the levelling up budget that Boris Johnson promised in his 2019 election to give to the North in order to upgrade their infrastructure and their regional opportunities. Because for those who don't know, there's kind of a stigma around the Conservative Party post Thatcher because the closure of the coal mines and the unwillingness to do regional investment under neoliberalism meant that lots of the North felt that their communities and their intergenerational job opportunities were decimated. And so they held it against the Conservatives and that's handed Labour successive victories in the heartlands and also obviously handed it to Blair after John Major, even though the parties are pretty much the same. Boris Johnson broke that said red wall and now, and this is something from Matt Goodwin's book, and we'll be talking to Matt Goodwin pretty soon on the website, so stay tuned. Six in ten of Boris Johnson voters in 2019 are just checked out of politics. They're not even necessarily flipping to the other side. They just don't feel represented. And one of the major reasons is migration. They just feel that they're getting the raw end of the deal. Why should I go to work and pay for some boat migrant to sit in a hotel, have a cleaner come round and clean up his mess, and he can buy brand new trainers and cigarettes while I can't get a house? And I've lived here and my family have worked and lived here from basically nothing all of their lives. It's just not fair. Sorry, you said four out of ten or six out of ten? Six out of ten. So that's a very big number. That's staggering. That is just mass disenfranchisement. And it shows that people do not think that there is anyone who is actually advocating for something different. I I can't really name, other than a couple of politicians, which we will name in here and give credit to, anyone who's at least at the top end of politics who substantively represents my interest. I think reform are doing some good policies, but they need a rebrand and their unwillingness to have conversations with other people in the disparate right parties, particularly Andrew Bridgen, who is an excellent MP and a very nice man that we've had on the show and I've obviously spoken to offline occasionally as well. The fact that they ostracised him from the party shows that they're also out of touch with the dissident sphere, that the people that feel that they weren't represented through lockdown, through immigration, through high taxes. And so there needs to be a merging here. They can't just be establishment because people are just fed up. I think it's very, let's say, uh, weird to think that uh, Liz Truss mm. essentially didn't understand anything from the last 20, 25 years. And she went back into advocating a form of Thatcherism when it seemed to me that conservative people want to move away from that paradigm mm. and want to embrace a different one. Well, we're less focused on materialism. I think Truss's economic policies were not bad. She did not crash the economy. The guilt market was about to collapse on the Friday before. And on the Monday when she announced her budget, she was a convenient scapegoat. I'm not a big Truss fan. She's dim as a two-watt bulb, but she didn't deserve that. But Truss was contemplating free movement with India. She wanted to, again, increase migration, entirely out of touch with the British electorate, who actually have to live in these communities and say, my country on my doorstep looks nothing like what my dad lived in, and I wanted that. I can't live anywhere else other than England because I'm sentimentally attached to it. Don't turn it into an economic zone for people when the rubber hits the road who will just flee back home and take their money with them and have no ties to the place. It's very alienating. It's not very nice. And that's only going to get worse under Sunak. So if we go to the next one, Rishi Sunak has now ditched the manifesto pledge that 
started under David Cameron to reduce migration, continued under Boris Johnson, but Boris Johnson increased migration, and now Sunak has ruled out explicitly committing to reducing migration, despite facing record le levels of net migration, so it's going to peak at at least 700,000. It might go up to a million net this year. Now, bear in mind, that's nearly double what it was June last year, 2022, of 504,000 net. So double inside a year. That's utterly infeasible. We've got crumbling transport infrastructure. We haven't upgraded our roads. We haven't upgraded our sewage systems practically since the Victorian era. And so we're massively increasing the population that have stuff flowing through that. The NHS is dying on its knees and that might be the better if something was to take its place. But instead, we've just constantly got to pay more for it and can never keep up with funding. Everything's going to pot. And instead, again, you're glutting the country with people that need services on demand the moment they arrive here. It's unsustainable. So, Mr Sunak refused to get drawn on speculation of what next week's numbers will show, though he defended last year's record high by pointing out it included large numbers of Ukrainian refugees. New visa schemes for people coming from Hong Kong, Afghanistan and Ukraine made up 138,000 of last year's 504,000. Okay. First of all, I understand the temporary stays for Hong Kong. Because back in 1998, the British government dropped the ball and seceded sovereignty to them when they very much would like still to have our, our partnership to defend them from neighbouring mainland China. And so China came in and assumed Hong Kong and stole up its citizenship, and we continue to deal with China, legitimising their actions. So actually taking in a few Hong Kong refu refugees temporarily to then repatriate them when they get their country back, I'm totally for. Not with 400,000 other people on top of that who are never going to leave. Not good. The Prime Minister said he's crystal clear about wanting net migration to come down, admitting it's too high. I'm committed to bringing down the levels of migration, we're clear about that. There are a range that we're considering, at the same time I think people know I'm relentlessly focusing on stopping the boats, because levels of illegal migration are too high, and they've escalated massively over the last few years. See the sleight of hand they play there. He isn't committed to bringing down the net number, he's instead, I'll bring migration down by stopping the small boats. That is a yeah. fraction of a percentage. Every year, you're importing a city the size of Liverpool. Now it's going to be two cities the size of Liverpool into the UK who immediately need housing and infrastructure and transport. And he thinks this is going to have no impact? People care about more than just the small boats. The thing is that it seems to me that this policy is just geared to show an image of mm. some boats, let's say, being... Uh, turn towards the other side. Mm. But as you say, that it doesn't necessarily tackle the problem. It's electorally expedient, but he wishes to continue with the actual problem, which is the cultural and economic effects of mass migration. Because they've got themselves into a death spiral with lower birth rates, economic disincentives to having families, and the election cycle means that you're not planning for the long term, you're planning for the next four years. Exactly. And so if, if every year, if your economic policy is tanking the economy, if you just bring in more people, then GDP goes up because more people are having more money change hands. It doesn't matter if GDP per capita, per person, the average earnings are going down. Instead, it's that slow growth graph. And so I would love to have this question answered. If we're importing so many doctors, lawyers and engineers, and immigration is great for the economy, why is growth just not exponentially jumped? Yeah. It's because it's just not the case. It's a lie. So stop it. The cabinet recently split over immigration because the chancellor, education secretary, health secretary and Scottish secretary disagreed with the home secretary, Suella Braveman, who wanted to decrease the numbers. And bear in mind, Suella Braveman is currently being faced with an ethics probe because she may or may not have used expenses to claim for a speeding ticket. And so Sunak is consulting an independent ethics advisor over whether or not to oust her for the party for this. Now, I think it's a stupid thing to do. I don't want my politicians wasting my tax money on, on things like that anyway, just on principle. But it's obvious that if she gets ousted for that, it's because she is going against the orthodoxy. Because okay. as you said, Sunak is saying one thing, trying to look like he's on the side of the electorate, and selling them short on the other. Because he actually doesn't care. So uh, I want to ask you about this. Uh, there is an image, let's say, outside the UK that politicians in the UK are, are uniquely sensitive to things like that. And they frequently resign over things like, you know, someone watching some, uh, let's say, questionable material. Oh, thing. Do you th yes. Do you think that's that's fake? It's just that there are deeper reasons why they are they get ousted and they find come up with a silly excuse that's a good question i think they often pressure mps to leave for political reasons rather than matters of principle because yeah. angela rayner for example claiming airpods on her expenses 
okay, there's, there's not really much different from Suella Braverman other than Suella obviously minorly broke the law, which isn't good either. But the perfect example is the Chris Pincher affair with Boris Johnson. So last summer, one of the things that catalyzed Boris Johnson's exit was that Chris Pincher was going around literally pinching young men. And it was well known. And Boris Johnson was going to appoint him a new position of authority within the Conservative Party, despite knowing this. And so he had had so many ethics complaints against him, but they only took action when it started looking bad for Boris in the papers. Yeah. And so they'll let their side get away with, and this this goes for both parties, they'll let their side get away with practically anything as long as it doesn't draw too much political fire and lose them too many votes. Okay. And so the bus is only there to throw people under when it's going to be costly for the party, not because they've done something wrong necessarily. And that's what I think the Braverman thing is. This will be, if she goes, it will be an excuse for the fact that she just wants to lower migration. And okay. even then, Suella Braverman's a liberal. As I said, she was the only person to show up doing some sort of premature election speech at the conference with a teleprompter on either side of her. And she said that the thing that the UK stood for was equality. That's conservatism. It's like, no, 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 that's liberalism. You just don't understand what people want, do you? So Jeremy Hunt had signalled to business leaders at the British Chamber of Commerce this week that immigration controls would be eased further to plug labour shortages in the short term. Why do we have endless labour shortages again? Oh yeah, because the more people that come here en masse, the more security you need, the more care home workers, the more hospital staff, the more infrastructure upgrades. So it's a self-generating problem. You're always going to have a labour shortage if you just keep importing loads of people here to generate more jobs to meet the demand. Stop it. Sustainable growth. Have kids instead. But you won't do that, will you? Scottish Secretary Alistair Jack said he's entirely supportive of high levels of immigration to boost the Scottish workforce. And this is why the Conservatives have absolutely no foothold in Scotland. This morning, the Telegraph revealed that the Education Secretary Gillian Keegan said she is hugely proud that 600,000 foreign students are now coming to the UK. An active target at the Department of Education said they've hit eight years early. Oh, brilliant. We've ruined the country even faster than expected. And then get this. A departmental memo seen by the Telegraph said the 600k target for international students is not a one-year expectation. We're expected to deliver on it every year. It's the new normal to have 600,000 transitory foreign students to come in every year. And the reason this is a problem is because all of the universities and the accommodation providers are addicted to foreign money. Because the Chinese students can come in, pay higher fees, pay for higher accommodation costs up front, create mini ethnic enclaves the entire time, and then take all of their skills back to their home country to then steal our intellectual property and undermine our country. And then you get chain migration as well of where um, students from other countries will bring over their family members even though they're not studying. Okay, yeah. So you'll just get loads of people coming in. It's an endless problem. And then, speaking of someone openly seditious, Michael Gove at the conference, just to highlight this, if you think your concerns are going to be addressed, this man is holding the ideological testicles of the party in a vice at the moment. Not the first time he's probably held a pair. And he says that if you focus on culture wars, you're going to lose. So... It's all about the consensus. They know where they're going to take us. It's the progressive technocratic future. They're just negotiating how fast we're going to get there, how much money we're going to spend getting there, and how we're going to sell it to the plebs. I think that's atrocious because if he doesn't formulate, and if the conservatives don't formulate a positive vision, mm. it's not going to work. What's going to buy into? Yeah, nobody's excited about marginal tax rates increasing yeah. or decreasing. Yeah, And it's because... If you try to articulate or, a rousing vision of the future, it cuts against the vision that they secretly want. Or you could say that, it, I mean, obviously, taxes do matter, but they are not the only thing that matters. Sure. But and to the extent that he says that people shouldn't care just about culture war, mm. it seems that he's advocating for that rhetoric to be used, the rhetoric that just fo focuses on taxes. Yeah, but that's because if you're you know, negotiating... It, when you have uh, culture war issues, you should abstain from touching them. Yeah. Because if you're negotiating everything like you're moving beads on an abacus, then you're playing within the abacus, right? You're playing within the neoliberal paradigm. Yeah. And so the moment you engage in culture wars, you're talking about substantive moral issues rather than just how much money goes here and how much goes there. What they really want is to deprive you of the moral language to disagree with them. And so you're slowly losing over time. And that's what yeah. Michael Gove does. That's why he's a sort of mover and shaker in politics, because he can reframe the debate so that his opponents will always agree with him and then he'll get what he wants. Just reject the paradigm. And it seems that that's actually happening. So a group has risen to the occasion. They're calling themselves the New Conservatives. Now, this is not the first pressure group within the Conservative Party. We've had things like the European Research Group before that spearheaded Brexit, involving Jacob Rees-Mogg. But the New Conservatives are a dozen MPs drawn from the 2017-2019 intakes, and they want a fundamental realignment of the party so it better reflects the interests of voters in the Midlands and across the Red Wall in the North. So we're seeing that 
constituency that feels alienated, that six out of 10, be substantively represented. And there's quite a few people that share their sentiments down here, down south, me included. So the members are Lee Anderson, who's Deputy Party Chairman, 30p Lee, as people like to call him, Andrew Lua, Danny Kruger, Nick Fletcher, Miriam Cates, Alex Stafford, Jonathan Gullis, and Sarah Atherton. I might suggest allowing Desmond Swain to join too, but we'll hope. So if you're not familiar with some of these MPs, we'll go we'll go through that in a moment. I just want to go through this exclusive interview. So for taxes, Cates has called to an end to fiscal drag because people are being pulled into upper tax brackets by inflation, despite not actually getting any more money. They want to replenish the armed forces because this has been the lowest since the Napoleonic Wars, and we've basically depleted and gutted our reserves whilst funding Ukraine. They've said they want to make sure make it so that Tony Blair's university admissions target goes down so they can fund practical skills and apprenticeships, which will be useful when AI takes everyone's job. They said about family policy, of course, at the National Conservative Conference, which we've already covered, but they want people to have more babies and lower immigration. And they've got quite a lot on immigration, actually. So Lee Anderson said... It is clear that immigration should be a priority. I suspect if you knocked on 100 doors in any of our constituencies and asked them if migration was too high, 99 will said yes. So he's appealing to the actual issues that the people want represented. He said, while he believed migration could be a good thing, there must be limits. Most of us who sit in that chamber don't have to worry about being on the council house waiting list. They don't have to worry about getting a dental appointment. We don't just sit there in pain because their knee operation has been cancelled for the 10th time. These are real things that affect people in our areas, those we represent. Sometimes I don't think we do a very good job of it because the message is not cutting through. We need to gently remind people that, that, that uh, in that place, what's happening in the real world. Britain, he argued, was at risk of becoming full up. In 50 years' time, our children and our grandchildren will look at us on YouTube or whatever and say, why didn't you sort it out? If the population continues to increase at this rate and migration's at a million a year, in 50 years' time, there's going to be no space in this island. Our children, our grandchildren will say, why? You had the chance to sort it out. At some stage, our country will be full. What do we do then? He's appealing to the intergenerational project, not just the next four years and a GDP graph. It's an actual conservative mindset. This is encouraging. Asked whether the Tories really could meet their pledge to reduce migration to less than 250,000, given the scale of numbers, the new Conservatives were adamant that the government must try. Danny Kruger said that he's adamant that they must leave the ECHR, whereas Andrew Lua, who's a bit more of a moderate, said that he's ambivalent, but they're all just agreeing that it doesn't matter what we do as long as we get results. So I thought, just to finish up, we'll look at the careers of these individual people in case okay. you weren't familiar with them, obviously, being an outsider to British politics, or in case some of our viewers aren't as Westminster wonky as some of us. So we'll look at the honour roll, and it's half encouraging, because this is the role of people in 2021 who voted against vaccine passports. Now, half of the members voted against them, but Nick Fletcher, Alex Stafford, Jonathan Gullis, and Sarah Atherton voted for vaccine passports. So that got my ears up. And so they've got a bit of a hill to overcome for goodwill, for me, personally. But given this was a couple of years ago, there may have been some misinformation or, and this isn't to insult them, but a bit of cowardice on their part, thinking that they're only backbenchers, they'll be whipped into shape, they'll lose the whip otherwise, because the COVID hysteria was as bad for society as it was within the party, I'm sure. I think there's some room to forgive them if they make the right noises, make the right apologies, and advocate for the right policies. Now, I don't necessarily trust Stafford yet, and I will say why. In his summary, and I've just taken a cursory look for his career, he self-described himself as a Margaret Thatcher fan. He said that he likes David Cameron's social democratic policies, and that he was arguing that lockdown was the prime opportunity to instigate a green revolution. So you've got a lot of goodwill to make up with me, buddy. I tell you that now. But start changing that around and we'll see. But, but let's go on to some of the other members. So Jonathan Gullis... I just liked this. Um, he said that anyone who's promoting the term white privilege should be reported to the Home Office as, as political extremists. I, I love this. Yeah, exactly. See? I, See? I this is the spirit we want to manifest. This. Yeah. The, the unapologetic crushing of one's enemies is the stage that we've gotten to because they don't want to negotiate with us. They don't want to talk about how to get to the same destination. Again, we're using parallel moral languages here. They view us as evil. We are in an existential way of defending our way of life. Therefore, okay, if they're going to accuse everyone of inherent racism, inherent sin, and therefore should be persecuted to correct historical grievances. No. No, sorry. You Just don't you don't deserve government funding to do that. Stop whining. You can build <laughs> Good you, reference. you can you can build a society just on victimization. You need more than that. Yeah, grievances and in tropic. These people you are referring to, I hope they they succeed in getting this message across. Absolutely. Let's go on to Lee Anderson. Carl's already covered him pretty comprehensively in this segment on Rumble, so you can go and check that out, please, John, if you go to the next tab. And Lee Anderson, just to summarise his career, uh, he's pro-death penalty. 
very based. He's a Brexiteer, and he waived his party chairman's salary when he got the position, so he didn't want to take public money. He's instead taken on a contributor role at GV News for 100000 which I think, despite going on GV News pretty frequently, I love the network, I think it's fair to maybe criticise the amount of MPs that are on there, because you'd hope that they're focusing more on representing their constituency rather than just juggling other jobs, but mm. I'd rather he takes private capital then takes a significant pay boost because I think loads of MPs are overpaid anyway. Like, do you know during the pandemic, for example, when they were doing loads of money printing and everyone was out of work and we were all broke and we're now facing inflation, do you know the MPs stuck in a pay rise for themselves? Parasites. The lot of you. Anyway, <coughs> going on to the next one, Andrew Lua. So he's a former MEP turned Brexiteer and he's a member of the Common Sense Group and he co-signed this letter because during the pandemic, they decided to try and ban church services. And there was actually deliberation of whether or not they were going to ban the Armistice Day service for social distancing. And I like this letter that he's helped author and sign because it says, here, the Common Sense Group was formed to speak for the silent majority of voters tired of being patronised by elitist bourgeois liberals whenever issues such as immigration or law or order are raised. Part of our mission is to ensure that the institutional custodians of history and heritage, tasked with safeguarding and celebrating British values, are not coloured by cultural Marxist dogma, colloquially known as the woke agenda. History must neither be sanitised nor rewritten to suit snowflake preoccupations. A clique of powerful, privileged liberals must not be allowed to rewrite our history in their image. Now, not only is that an actual really good bit of prose with some powerful alliterative imagery there, but he identifies the problem perfectly. These people are our enemies. They're tasked with dismantling and decolonizing a place that was never colonized. And all they want to do is build atop the ashes. And they're most of the way there. So the group better get ready to uh, conserve something instead. And for, uh, for many years, it seems to me that they flew under the conservative radar. Yes. And apparently they fly under the Michael Gove's radar still. I would suggest that Michael Gove is happy to let this go on. Okay. That would be my inclination. <coughs> Just to finish up on the last two, here's Nick Fletcher. Nick Fletcher was actually ripped for suggesting in a parliamentary debate that male role models are being abluted from the media because they're being racially and sexually recast with black women. And he said that, is there any wonder that when the only role models in media are the likes of Tommy Shelby and the gangsters, that young men don't feel substantially represented and don't have missions of heroism to aspire to? And some SNP guy said that uh, in a reboot of The Equalizer, Queen Latifah playing the title role that Denzel Washington would otherwise play was positive. And Nick Fletcher turned around and said that the government should be helping men to be proud to be men rather than feeling awful about their gender. I think putting forward a positive message is quite all right, actually. So that's a good step in the right direction. And the last one, and this is the spirit that I really wanted manifested, Sarah Atherton. Now, Sarah Atherton is uh, 2019 intake MP. She's not done all that much since starting, of course, because most politics has been brought up by the pandemic. But she got a lot of flack because she just said, uh, let's deploy the army in the channel to stop the boats. Rishi Sunak isn't suggesting that. But she's just like, Royal Britannia, back on the waves, lads. And she didn't back off of this. She got loads of flack for it. But no, didn't apologise. And this is the point. This is the kind of spirit I want. This is why this group is encouraging after this conference. You've got to learn that the progressives will not cut you any slack. They hate you. They want to tear asunder your civilization. And so rather than speaking by the terms of their debate, rather than moving the beans on that abacus and allowing society to fall apart, you flip over the board, reject their moral framework, do not apologise, and double down. So I look forward to see what comes from this group, and hopefully it's something positive. If you appreciated that segment from the podcast The Lotus Eaters, you can go to lotuseaters.com to get access to all the premium content that's on the website, such as the Epoch series, this episode on the life of Lenin. If you'd like to find out what else is being put out, you can follow on Getter at lotuseaters underscore com on Getter. Thank you and goodbye.